That's a good thing for us to remember. Our, what kind of soil is our hearts? And Jesus is such a good storyteller. And I, I thought of this morning one of the parables that he told. In fact, he told a couple of them that were about the kingdom. His parables were a lot of times about God's kingdom, which even though the earth belongs to God, the world system is not a part of his kingdom. And if you think about how he introduces one of his parables where he says there was once a nobleman who went into a far country to claim a kingdom for himself and he gives us this picture like he is from another country not from the earth he's from a distant kingdom and you could imagine it if it was if it was mankind this big wealthy beautiful city with justice and mercy and all good things and and then there's another city in which the people live, but it's, it's darkened. And even though that city rightfully belongs to the good king, it has been tricked and fallen into darkness by a rebel in the city. And the, the old um, Egyptian bishop Athanasius describes this in his own way, and I'm not copying his exact words, but it's a beautiful picture taking sort of Jesus' parables and putting them together. And even though the city belongs to the good king, it's fallen into darkness. And so he sends his own son into that city, but kind of veiled, cloaked, so that not everyone knows who he is. And, and in the end, that son will return back after his mission is completed to the great city, the beautiful city where he belongs. And instead of wearing these sort of, this sort of cloak, which, which is the flesh that he came in, when it, this, this cloak which sort of... Uh, hides his, his true nature as, as God, but as this, this person coming from this kingdom, now he takes that cloak off, he returns to the king, uh, to, to his throne, and he has his royal robes on, and he has his scepter again, and he's ruling again, but he's left his people in that city. And his people are to continue the mission for which he came. Anyone following me still? Now, this is the place that we find ourselves in the scripture that we're reading today in John 17. Anyone know what this chapter is called? Popularly called. Oh, pastor knows. <laughs> the high priestly prayer. Amen. And this is the very end of Jesus' address. So just to put you in the setting that he says this, this is the end of Jesus' public ministry. And that's part of what he says here, that I've finished everything. And he, this is the same setting in which he had the Last Supper with his disciples. And so this included the foot washing that's so famous, where the master gets down and washes the feet of his disciples. And it includes his teaching and his final words. And he, he sort of, for a moment, and Pastor Steve preached on this last week, he stops talking in parables and he says plainly, listen guys, I'm going to the Father and you're not going to see me anymore for now. In fact, this scripture that we're going to read opens with these words. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, then he began his prayer. And the words that Jesus had finished speaking, to sum them up a little bit, were these. It said, he said that he was going to go away, but that God would send his spirit. And that the spirit would actually be better to be with the spirit than if Jesus was present with them although it's hard to imagine. Number two, he said that after I go, you're going to have sorrow and you're even going to have persecution, people coming against you. But don't think that that's because God is angry with you. This is what's coming to you. And number three, he said, I have overcome the world. So even through the persecution and sorrow that you're going to experience, you're going to overcome it because of, because of me. Now I'm trampling on our cords. That's not part of the parable. So let me read the scripture for us. This is the word of the Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, 
the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Wow. Amen. Just a quick thing to notice. As Jesus, you know, Jesus has had multiple prayers as we read in the New Testament and even in the book of John. And, and in each prayer, he's showing us something about what it really means to pray to God as a person, as a human. And something that is good to notice is how Jesus prays, not just with his mind and not even just with his voice, but with his whole body. So when, there, when, he, when you're in anguish, I, I want to tell you to follow him in this, to learn how to pray from Jesus. When you're in sorrow or when you're repenting and you're at home and you're praying and you're not... Have you ever bowed down? Have you ever bowed your head, um, even wept? When you're rejoicing with God, have you ever lifted up your hands like this? When you're asking God to, for, for uh, supply, that he would supply your needs, do you, do you use your body in that prayer? And here Jesus, he's, it sounds like he's inside as far as I can tell. So he's not even looking up at the heavens. He's looking up like us would right now to the ceiling. And he says, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father. And I just want to, that's a little bit of an aside, but how Jesus prays is with his whole being, with his whole body. And so as he finishes speaking to his disciples, he kind of segues straight into prayer. And that's another good thing to follow him in. Sometimes when we're talking about a thing, when we're talking about a spiritual thing, we need to stop talking and start praying. Amen? Amen. And allow God to do his work. And so Jesus stops the teaching to his disciples, and without any warning, just begins praying. And he lifts up his eyes and he says, Father, and I want to exhort you, if that's not a part of your prayer life, to, to use your whole being in prayer and to follow Jesus' example. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. In fact, it's almost the minute has come. Because I read through this whole high priestly prayer, and if you skip ahead to chapter 18, the next, the next chapter, right then, he walks outside and he's arrested. I mean, you know, he goes to the garden, but he's arrested there this night. So he's saying, this is the very end of my ministry. The hour has come. It's right now. This is my final prayer with my disciples in security of this room before I walk out and I walk into the hands of um, violent men. He says something that you and I should be careful to say. Glorify your son. Well, we don't have to be careful about that. Don't say glorify me, though. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, this isn't the first time that this concept has been in the book of John or elsewhere in the scriptures. That word glorify is the Greek word doxazo. And if you, that, that might sound like something we just sang this morning. Do you know the, the, that, the song, the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen? So doxazo is the same like doxology, which means to worship, to magnify, to honor, to praise, to celebrate. Those are different ways of saying it. He says, do that to me, glorify me, celebrate me, honor me, glorify me, so that I may glorify you. When you glorify the Son... This is true for us as well. The Son glorifies the Father. And this is part of the relationship that's known as the Trinity that existed, as Jesus said, before the world began. In fact, although it's not in this exact prayer, just one chapter ago it says, the Holy Spirit, who's the third person of that Trinity, also glorifies the Son. This is in 1614. He says, by taking Jesus' words and bringing them to us, the Spirit glorifies the Son and the Son always glorifies the Father, and that's a part of the relationship of the Trinity. So as we learn that, we know how to glorify God. We know how to lift Him up. So this short prayer, my, my reading to myself was about four minutes long. 
says a lot about this glorif- you know, glorified doxazo. He says later on, we're not preaching this this week, he says that I, Jesus, have manifested your name. I've manifested God's name while I was here on earth. Jesus says that I'm glorified in my people. That's those of us here who are following him and who have believed in him. That Jesus is glorified in us. Isn't that amazing? And you see how that relationship, Jesus to his people, fits into the relationship of the Trinity. Amen? His people are glorified Jesus, and it's the Holy Spirit who is helping us to do that, and then Jesus is glorifying the Father. He says that not only am I glorified in my people, but Jesus says that glory, his glory has been given to his people. Now that's a big one, so we'll preach on that when we get there. And he says, in order to be united, in order to be unified, in order to be one is what he says. My glory has been given to my people in order that they would be one. And then Jesus prays to the Father at the end of this prayer, Father, I want them to see my glory just as it was before the foundation of the world. In other words, his people, you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus says, God, show them my glory as it was. That is, before he had... He was cloaked in in flesh before even the world began. And there's so much scripture about this. And the word was with God and the word was God. And it was Jesus, the word of God at at creation, who was co-creating with God. If you ever heard that word co-creating in the New Age sense, you know, that came from uh, the Bible. It came from actually the old creeds that Jesus is co-creator. So we we can claim that word back. And then he goes on to say another interesting thing. Glorify me since you've given me authority over all flesh. So if you turn that phrase around, Jesus is saying, because you've given me all this authority, Father, because you've given me authority to give eternal life to all the people you've given me, because of that, glorify me now so that I can glorify you. In John 5, a few chapters ago, it says this. This is Jesus' words. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. In fact, I guess it's right now because Jesus said the hour has come. Well, I take that back (laughs) based on what this says. An hour is coming and is now here when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear shall live. The dead shall live when they hear the voice of the Son of God. Here's the important part to us. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And so in that scripture, we see kind of Jesus jumping off of his previous teaching and saying, the hour is now come that I have been given this authority and it it is explicitly taught by him earlier, this authority is the authority to execute judgment and that judgment is I give you eternal life and I do not give you eternal life. And it's merciful that God chooses Jesus to do this because he is a man. And so he's the judge of, other man, of all mankind and of all flesh. So because of that, he says, now glorify me, Father, so that I can glorify you. And this scripture I've brought up a number of times, it's amazing to me. The Father has life in himself. That is, his breath gives life and he's the fountain of life, so to speak. And in a mysterious way, he says... Now I've given that to the sun, that the sun is a fountain or a wellspring or a, um, I hesitate to say a, a fissure eight, but you know, a, uh, uh, <laughs> the source of life is in the sun now, not only in the Father. And then Jesus kind of takes a moment in a weird way. He, he gives a little mini teaching in here, and it's not that God needs to hear his teaching, but another perspective for us to have in prayer is that we're praying before God, but we're also praying before one another. Amen? 
And so when we pray, he takes a little aside and he's, he explains eternal life. So this is eternal life explained by Jesus. He says, now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And that's the end of his little aside. So eternal life explained by Jesus is to know God. In fact, that's what makes heaven, heaven, is to know God and to be with God. And not only to know God, but to know Jesus who was sent. And he calls himself Jesus Christ. And Christ means that he's the anointed one, the one that God chose, the one that God prophesied about, the one that God uh, was, that uh, he fulfilled all the prophecies. And there's another place when, when Paul is speaking to non-Jews where he calls him the appointed one. So I like to think of Jesus as the anointed one, if you know about that, or if not, he's the appointed one. So he's the anointed one, he's the appointed one. Paul says he's the appointed one who will judge all mankind. That's in Acts 17. And the final important thing that Jesus says here is basically my mission is now complete. Just like that mission I mentioned in the beginning where the the sun comes from the the city and, and goes into the dark city and he has a mission And it's important for us to know this because Jesus highlights it. There was nothing else for Jesus to do at this point. His mission is is complete. There wasn't another person that needed a healing according to God's plan. There wasn't another demon that needed to be cast out. He did not need to give another parable or a teaching. He didn't need to show any more about his holiness or about how he followed God and show us by his example. My mission is complete. And as he says to his disciples, you know, the same chapter, or the previous chapter. So now the Holy Spirit will continue the work of reminding you about what I did, this complete picture. And if you begin following Jesus today, whether you're 2 or 82, you're not going to reach the end of that journey uh, by, by following what Jesus did and said and who he was as he walked on this earth. So he said, my mission's complete. Now, there's nothing missing. And now, Father, I want to go to glory, to the same glory that existed in our relationship before I was born. In fact, before even the world was created. Before I was born as a man, I should say. In the beginning was the word, or the first words of this book. The word was with God. And what else? And the word was God. And that's what he's talking about. So the appointed and anointed one returns to his own place, to the glory that has always belonged to him. You know, just because the son, the prince, is in the other city, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have the same title. The glory still belongs to him as he was here. But as he returns home to his place, Um, it's different. It's now he's on the throne, now he's fully glorified. We only saw a picture of that while we were here. And now, unlike before, he is a man. And he's a man forever. And so as he came down and accomplished this work, he didn't return simply as the Word of God, but now as the second Adam and as a man and as, as our high priest. So to go back over those main points again, in conclusion, the Father glorifies Jesus. In John 8, he said this, If I glorify myself, Jesus said, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, to those who weren't believing, you say he is our God, but you have not known him. I know him, Jesus says. You claim that you know God. But if you know God differently from how Jesus knows God, you don't know the true God. Amen? And here, I think, is one of the keys to understanding this passage. It's one of his teachings in John 12. The Son of Man will be glorified through his death, through the conclusion of his purpose. And here's what he says in John 12. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. There's that word again. And then he explains, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, then what? 
it bears much fruit. So Jesus is talking about himself and he says, it's time for me to be glorified. And how I'm glorified is I die. And because of that, I bear much fruit. In fact, where's our seeds at? Anyway, all those seeds, hopefully, will be bearing, are they sunflowers? I can't remember. There's some kind of flowers. They'll be bearing much floral beauty. I don't know if they're edible flowers. He says, whoever loses his life, I'm sorry, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And when he says hates, it doesn't mean you're supposed to wake up in the morning being like, God, I hate the fact that you made me born. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, in comparison to what I'm hoping in, I, I, I don't count my life, like I don't count my money and my things and even things like my family, all the best things. I hate them in comparison to, to you. He doesn't mean that you're unthankful. And he says, now my soul is troubled. But what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, meaning his death. He says, no, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. He knew what his purpose was. And then he again says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. So the Father answers him and says, yes, I will glorify my name. I will do what you ask. I will fulfill my purpose and that will be Jesus Christ dying as, he, as was planned and bearing much fruit. And so in a strange way, but in a beautiful way, and in a way that you understand as God gives you wisdom, um, Jesus gl is glorified by his death on the cross. Now he was literally lifted up on top of a hill for everyone to see. So many witnesses. And not only so many witnesses, but here's what he says in, in John 3. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. And we preached on this, so I won't go over it again, but it's online if you want to listen to it. But Moses lifted up a bronze serpent so that everyone who was poisoned could look at the serpent and they would be, they would be uh, uh, saved. They wouldn't die. And the main point of that sermon, which, which it's, a, it's an amazing thing because this really happened in Moses' day, but it was a picture of what would happen with Jesus, is when you look on him, that's all you have to do. So what does that mean? You have to have faith, right? How is looking at a bronze serpent going to take the poison out of my blood? It's not going to happen. Well, God said it. So you need to just do it by faith, and then he will do the work. Amen? So it's, a pre, it's, a, it's showing us that it's all by faith. And then you're looking at a snake. Why are you looking at a snake, the very thing that bit you? Well, I, I believe it's because when we're willing to look on our sin, when we're willing to look on the cause of that death, which is our own sin, and we see Jesus being punished, and as he says, that's what we deserve, and we're willing to look at that and accept that, and, and that's where the healing comes from. But that's not the sermon today anyway. Uh, the point is, is that he will be lifted up. And the whole world has a chance to look on him. And if you look on him and believe, then just like that serpent, you will not die, but rather you'll have eternal life. And he says again in John 12, same, same kind of thing. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So again, Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up and now he was lifted up before tons and tons of witnesses in Jerusalem. And many of those witnesses wrote down this account. And in fact, besides the Bible, there are other accounts outside of the Bible of ancient uh, scribes writing about this. And so this is the most famous event ever to occur in human history. And if you've never thought of it that way, I challenge you to uh, pursue that. So he is still being lifted up. So everyone can hear, everyone can see this is the central point of history that this man was lifted up on a cross and what you decide to do with that determines whether you are no God or whether you don't know God. So I believe those verses are part of the key to understanding what he says here. Father, glorify me 
the hour has come, and as Jesus taught, to glorify me means it's time for me to be lifted up and for everyone to look. And then after that, I'll actually join you in heaven um, as I glorified you on earth. Now I will be with you in heaven, and I'll be glorified there. Moses, in Exodus 33, was the chosen man of God at that point, the anointed man who would lead his people. And there was a point at which he said, show me your glory, that word. And I don't know if you remember anyone here what God said in return, but it's not what you would expect. He said, God, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, which we often pronounce as Jehovah or Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. What an answer to that. Show me your glory. And he's probably thinking he wants a heavenly vision or he wants to see God as he is. And, and God says instead, you can't look at my face because no mortal can look at my face and live. But instead, I will pass before you and show you my goodness. And that's my answer to your question, show me your glory. And that's most perfectly fulfilled in Christ. So as Jesus said, what does it mean to have eternal life is to know God, the only God. He says the only true God, the creator of all people, no matter what you believe, you were created by this God. We know him now perfectly, most perfectly through Jesus who came down. The Bible says he's the perfect imprint of God's nature. He is the image of God and he shows us God's character and his name. And God knew exactly how to reach mankind from an invisible or unseeable or untouchable God. He came down so we could see him, hear him, touch him, eat with him, walk with him on the road, and all the other things that humans can do together. And he said, now that's who I am. Now here's what God did for Moses. It describes in the next chapter, 34. He says, it says, The Lord descended, Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And so you think, okay, so he just came down and said, Yahweh. <laughs> but that's not what the name of God means. The name is like, do you have a good name in this community? Do you have a reputation? What is your character? What are you known for? And so you see what God says when he proclaims his name. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So that's a long name. So he sums it up in Yahweh. You can call him Jehovah, Yahweh, or the Lord, or God. But when he speaks his name, he speaks all about what he is, gracious and merciful and forgiving and slow to anger and all those things. And it says Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And that's what we should do when we hear about who God is and what he is. So he said you need to know God. Now that's who God is. And also to know his son. Now why should we also know the son? And that's a part of eternal life. Isn't the son just a point to God and we should just know God? It's a question came to my mind. But here's the thing. The son is so integral and is such a part of God's plan. And of course is God. Uh, Jesus is God. He is our high priest, even now, alive today, interceding and praying for us, just as he did in this prayer. He's, he's alive, he is on the throne, and he is the continual revelation of God to us. And he's a man. He's still a man. And so as we one day receive the promise that he gave of eternal life and resurrection, we will be with him. And in fact... In, in Revelation 5.12, uh, speaking of the future times, it says that there's thousands and thousands of elders, which I believe are human, and then also heavenly beings, and they say this, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory 
and blessing. In other words, even in heaven, the, the call isn't, okay, I'm glad that cross thing is over with. Let's just forget about that because that was crazy. <laughs> Instead, it's a continual reminder that, look at my God, look at my King who came down and did this for us. And because of that, he's so worthy of all praise. Amen? Because he's not just transcendent and waiting to judge and righteous, but he comes down to the lowly, and he in fact dies for us, and in doing so, he bears a lot of fruit. So if you don't know God that way, Jesus says this is eternal life, that you'd know God and that you'd know Jesus Christ, the one whom he sent. And I pray that if you're not there yet, that you'll hear his words, you'll believe them, and you don't have to know everything right away. You can, just, you can begin walking this out by saying, God, I believe you. I believe that I need your covering for my sin. And I acknowledge my sin. I look to the cross, just like that bronze serpent, and I say, okay, I don't like to think of it that way. But that's, what I, that's, what my, that's the punishment that I deserve. And I bow my head and worship you because you're willing to forgive me through Jesus. I'd be happy to pray for you afterwards if you want any more help in that. And for the, to the church, to those of you here who are Christians, especially who, is a, who are a part of this church, Grassroots, um, I have a Babylon Bee article, which I'll read for you. You know that satire, Christian satire group? And he says, um, this one says, Church surrounded by five nursing homes asks God to reveal the next ministry opportunity. <laughs> Members of Cornerstone Fun Church, which has five nursing homes located within a three-mile radius, held a prayer meeting Wednesday night to ask God to show them how to use their time and resources to reach out to their community. Church leaders stated they were asking God would give them a sign showing them what kinds of fun, slick ministries they could start all while the Lord has placed several institutions filled with the sick and dying within a few blocks of their location. Church elders and members drove past several convalescent centers that housed the sick, and praying fervently for God to reveal ways to minister to the needy in their city. We just need the Lord to open doors for the gospel to reach the lonely and hurting in our neighborhood. We're thinking about a coffee house or a new skate park, said one member during the meeting. God, show us how best to love our neighbors. Get it? Yeah. And so I say that because uh, right now we have a brand newly constructed evacuee uh, shelters right next to us over here. And I, I hope that throughout the week you'll be praying for the people there. Uh, sister, sister, not sister, it's even on her name tag. Sister Clara is going to be the one uh, in charge of that. So please pray for her by name. She ran the ministry in Hilo um, under his wings which was for uh, serving the homeless for 15 years. And so now she's going to be here. And as I told Annabelle the other day, I think she really knows Jesus, because I don't say that about everyone. <laughs> and I think she does. And um, so we hope to, we, we have an opportunity as a church, which is wide open, um, that we're going to be there on nights and weekends. And uh, Robin and, and Dean are going to be especially helping with that. But part of my uh, call out to this church is, um, would you be willing to serve those people in whatever needs they have? And I mean even Bible readings, music, games. Um, it's going to be mostly Kapuna, so our elders, which is great because look how many kids we have. So I would love if, they're willing, if they'd like to participate in worship, they can come over here. Um, we're we're going to have a lot of open doors, and I'll share more. But uh, specifically, I would love it if we could put a schedule together and some of us could take the weekends there. So Grassroots Church is going to be there for the weekends and the evenings to help with just whatever needs crop up with the people, if they need someone to make a phone call for them, if they need help getting around, or if they need questions answered, things like that. Um, I would love to have those of us here sign up for those um, weekends, and we can spend time with them. And I'll also reach out to other churches as well, because this is an area where churches can definitely partner together. So please lift up your eyes to heaven and and, uh, and uh, ask how God would have you serve. Uh, we don't need a, a new skate park or a new coffee house. We already have the best one. Um, <laughs> so that's my exhortation to us as a church. Um, Jesus' work is done. He said so. My work is finished. But he explicitly said that now he leaves his work 
in the hands of his disciples. Amen? When he left, he left the task now to the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to help with the kapuna who are on our front step, uh, and with all the things that I mentioned. And God says this about glorifying him. In, in uh, chapter 14, he says, Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that, my, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See that? That when we ask God godly things in Jesus' name, he says, I'm going to answer your prayer. And that glorifies the Father. And this, this church, this, even this coffee house, that thing over there, I've been praying for something almost just like that for about four years, and I'm sure other people have as well. To see God answer prayers is so much better than doing it ourselves, Because then we can look back and say, wow, I prayed for that and, it, and God answered that prayer. And now the Father's glorified and my faith is built up to continue to pray. He also says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So as we walk with him, and I think there's at least two senses that we bear fruit. We bear fruit by becoming like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. As we grow in those, we bear fruit. And number two, and this is probably more what he means, we bear fruit by our word going out to others. They believe God's word. They become children of God. That's bearing fruit, is the multiplication which is what is Jesus' purpose. And you'll see this in this prayer as well. He says, I'm not only praying, this is at the end of his prayer, I'm not just praying for the people in front of me, the 12, or the 11, I should say. I'm praying for all those who will hear from them and believe that all of them will become one. What an amazing prayer. So let me pray that for us now, because that's Jesus' prayer. Lord, I want to pray for those here in Pahoa, in Puna, even in, in this building maybe right now, who haven't heard your word or who've heard it um, coming from a bad place uh, or who just haven't believed because of rebellion or, or for whatever reason, you said that you're praying for your disciples and not for the world. But you also said that you're praying for your disciples and those who will hear about you and believe. And we pray that we would be your mouthpiece, that we would be your witnesses, that we would be those who say, these things are true, you can know God and you can know His Son, and in that is eternal life. I pray that we would bear much fruit, and by doing so, we would glorify you. Amen.